everyone, welcome into Real Deal Sports Talk with KP. It is July 7th, 2019. What an exciting day in sports we've already had today. If you are a soccer or a football fan, this is your day. You've got to be excited. You've got to be all over the place. If you call yourself a patriotic sports fan, today has to be your day as well. Uh, start off the show, we automatically, we got a hit on it. It was a great match this morning, uh, USA women's national team taking on the Dutch, the Netherlands in the women's World Cup finale. They go on to win it two to nothing. They had chances; it could have been five to nothing. Great match, great show of dominance right now on the world stage. Uh, you know, what can you say? They've done it two World Cups in a row. They've put their money where their mouth is. They're not going to the White House. They're not going to be part of the teeny weeny parade. They went out there. They handled their business. Rapino scores on a penalty kick. Lavar scores uh, uh, going up the middle where they just didn't know what to do, where the defense got lost. She was able to escape up the middle, basically kick it into the back right corner, just getting it past the goalie. And that goalie for the Netherlands, they, she was on point today. She was getting and diving and blocking and getting in right position for all kinds of stuff. She was getting lucky with the ball glancing off her side, getting lucky with the ball glancing off her foot, and she was able to get it with her hand. But excellent game. I mean, excellent game. She took the onslaught that the United States came with, and you know, ultimately the United States just had too much. So congratulations to the women on the women's national soccer team, but also congratulations to the women's national volleyball team as they won their tournament today as well. And I think for the second year in a row. Um, so congratulations to both women's national teams, volleyball and soccer for what you've done. Soccer, I mean, you're changing lives. There's little girls who are growing up with these women as heroes now, heroines, heroes, what have you. And you've got to respect that. You've got to respect what they're doing, the changes they're making, the stances that they're making. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like them, but you have to respect it. They're putting it out there. They're putting their money where their mouth is. They're putting their actions where their mouth is. They're backing it up on the field. They're doing stuff that matters off the field. So to me, hey, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought the salute with the, the, the celebration Sipping the tea was perfect. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's people of my generation. But I thought that was the perfect little get over on your opponent. Yes, you're facing England. Yes, they're known for sipping tea. So here's a sip of tea. Toast. Yes, it's a double standard that that athlete was called out for doing that cheer, for that celebration, when all of the different things that men have done Celebrating touchdowns and home runs and three pointers and you have you you name it, but they're making their mark. It's amazing. They're fun to watch. They're exciting. They've got bravado. And if you missed it this morning, hey, I'm sure you can find it somewhere else. I'm sure there's going to be clips of it. They're going to be on the highlight shows. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on social media. There's probably some place where you can go rewatch the whole game. And you should. It was a great game for the championship. Only one I've watched all the way through. I've seen highlights till this point. But I made a point of watching that game today. And it was a great game. Once again, great game. Congratulations to the women's national soccer team. Second straight Gold Cup victory for the championship. All right, other things we're going to talk about on the show today. We've got, it's the season of lists. There's a new interesting one that came out. Uh, Elliot Harrison put out his top 25 quarterbacks of all time. He enlisted the support of Jack Andrade, research maven for the NFL Network. Uh, the two of them collaborated on historical pieces before, such as comparing quarterbacks from 92 to 2017 with statistical equalizers. So they put together their list of the top 25. Um, we'll go through it here in a little bit, in a minute. And 
what then I'm going to do after we go through their list is that I will reorder with the same quarterbacks. I'm not going to introduce any new quarterbacks, whether I think they should be on this list ahead of these guys or not. I'm going to take the quarterbacks that Elliot Harrison used on his NFL.com story. And I'm going to reorder them the way I think they should have been ordered. So we'll get to that. We have the top five and bottom five offensive line groups in the NFL. So says me. Uh, we've got all this basketball news to talk about. So let's just get into it really quick. Elliot Harrison's top 25 quarterbacks of all time. We will start at 25 and move to one. Some I'll have comments on, some I won't. That's just how it's going to be. We don't have time to talk about all of them and get to everything uh, that I want to get to today. So at 25, Norm Van Brocklin played for the Rams, played for the Philadelphia Eagles back in the 40s and 50s into 1960. At 24, Lynn Dawson played for the Steelers, the Browns, the Dallas Texans, the Kansas City Chiefs. 23, Fran Tarkington, Minnesota Vikings, uh, and the New York Giants. Personally, I think 23 might be a little low for Fran Tarkington. Uh, his style, what he meant to that era, the way he ran around changed the view of what quarterbacks could could do and be used at, and the way he did it was just a little bit better and a little bit different than everybody else at the time. So maybe a little low for Fran Tarkington there, Fran Tarkington there on Elliott's list. This next guy, way too low on the list in my opinion. I understand he didn't win any Super Bowls, but for me, you have to take into his time in the Canadian Football League. Uh, and that's Warren Moon at 22. Played for the Oilers, the Vikings, Seahawks, Kansas City Chiefs, and I've had this debate on the show before. Warren Moon, if you add in his entire pro career, because people wouldn't draft him because of the color of his skin to play the position he played, and he had to go play in another league to show that he could do it. If he had that whole time put onto his career, he's at 70,000 yards passing. His touchdown numbers are near the all-time record. His yardage mark is there. His wins would be up there. But instead, because of what he had to go through before 1984, he's at 22 on Elliott's list. I think that's far too low. 21, Jim Kelly uh, played for the Buffalo Bills, four straight Super Bowls. Tough quarterback, hard-nosed quarterback, winning quarterback, inspiring quarterback. Good pick there. Kurt Warner, I, at 20, he was always underrated. Underrated coming out of college. Underrated coming out of the Arena League. Underrated coming out of the grocery store. Um, played for the Rams, the Giants, and the Cardinals. I think he had a cup of tea, uh, no pun intended there, with the Green Bay Packers as well. Uh Ben Roethlisberger at 19, we know what he's been able to accomplish or help accomplish there in Pittsburgh. I could see him being a top 20 guy. Russell Wilson at 18, Seattle Seahawks, 2012 to present, probably the shortest term quarterback, shortest careered quarterback on this list for Elliott Harrison. Uh, 18, sure, Russell Wilson, he's a winner. Can't deny that. Two early Super Bowls in his career makes things happen gets bad teams to be average or above average teams. So, okay, Russell Wilson in his top 20. Terry Bradshaw at 17, underrated career, you know, four Super Bowl wins on a heavily run, heavily defensive team, but some exciting pass plays that we've all seen um, and got everything really started there for the Steelers and being one of those big teams that dominates a, a, a Super Bowl era. Sid Luckman at 16 for the Chicago Bears from 39 to 1950. Sid Luckman, I mean, he's really one of those guys you can contribute the passing game to. One of the early pioneers in the passing game. Obviously, one of the earlier careers on this list as well. So you got to have Sid Luckman on the list because of what he did again in his era, being one of the originators, one of the first guys to do it um, and do it well at a high level above anybody else that was going on at the time. Steve Young could probably be higher on this list as well at number 15. Uh, if he doesn't go to the USFL and spends his whole career in the NFL, doesn't have the years with Tampa Bay, doesn't have to sit behind Joe Montana, um, you know, this is a guy he led the league in passer rating five years in a row. I don't think anybody else has ever done something like that. We know his running, his running ability. He won the Super Bowl there with the 49ers. 
This next guy, I think he's the one of the most overrated great quarterbacks, Hall of Fame quarterbacks ever because of the team he was on, because his numbers uh, don't even compare to that of a, a, a Jay Cutler, and that's Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman, extremely accurate, extremely lucky to play in the system with the team, with the guys that he played with. I think with that team, with that offensive line, that running back, those weapons, and the defenses that they had rolling in and out of there at the time, you could have put just about any quarterback who was accurate, who that was his key skill set, accuracy, into that offense, and he would have been just as successful as Troy Aikman. Now, a lot of people say I bashed Troy Aikman. Look, in the 90s, I thought the Cowboys and what they were doing, that was great football. They were dominant. They were getting it done. I was not the, the fan of the team, but I respected the game. The way he's talked about now is if he's one of the all-time greats, I think is a joke. And to have him at 14 above Steve Young, above a Warren Moon, above a Kurt Warner, uh, above a Terry Bradshaw, uh, I'm sorry, above Jim Kelly, it just can't happen. That's ridiculous to me. That's way too – if you want to have him in your top 25, fine. But at 14 for Troy Aikman, he was not the catalyst that got the Dallas Cowboys to do anything. So that's way too high for me. At 13, Elliot, it's got uh, Bart Starr. More of a general in his time. You know, not the greatest passer. Not the guy who was going to go out there and light it up. But he was the general. He ended up being a player coach. Um, won the first, you know, couple Super Bowls. Won three out of four championships prior to that. Nice middle of the round guy. You know, I could see him being one of the middle middle quarterbacks give him his prop give him his respect for what he did but his numbers because of the era he played in are never going to live up to some of these newer guys because of where they played but he wasn't the most athletic he didn't have the biggest strongest arm he wasn't the fastest guy out on the field he was just the general out there at 12 he's got uh, Elliot Harrison's got Bart Brett Favre two Packers in a row coming in on this list uh, Brett Favre, as we all know, started with the Falcons, became famous with the Packers, and then had stops with the Jets and the Vikings, where he almost got back to the Super Bowl. Uh, probably should have got back to the Super Bowl with the Vikings. Brett Favre, statistically, his stats are up there on all of the good stuff, but they're also up there on all of the bad stuff. He was a competitor. He was a football player. He had all of the skill sets you want your quarterback to have, but he was just that guy who was going to go out there and play. And sometimes you were going to get five touchdowns. Sometimes you were going to get five picks. Sometimes he was going to be joshing with the, the, the defensive players. Sometimes he was going to be working the defensive players over. So I like that. I like that general area for Brett Favre. Now, I, I would have thought maybe top ten myself uh, just because of he is up there in so many statistical categories. He did have such a long career. He did start so many games in a different era of football in a row, and that record probably never gets broken. Going to number 11, almost to the top 10 now on Elliot Harrison's top 25 quarterbacks of all time. At number 11, slinging Sammy Baugh, 1937-52. to 52. Again, one of the originators uh, held the record for most passing yards in a game at 576, I want to say. Just amazing what he was able to do. One of the best early on. He's got to be on the list. I agree generally with that placement, um, but I'd probably put him a little further back because as he was dominating and doing what he was doing, just like Sid Luckman, they it was new. It wasn't something everybody knew what they were, how to attack, how to defend, uh, and how to work right. They didn't have as many athletes to choose from to come up with defenses and offenses and have these different weapons going. Uh, so you, you take that to account. Maybe Sammy Baugh is a little high on this list, but definitely should be on the list. All right, top 10 of Elliot Harrison's NFL.com, top 25 quarterbacks of all time. We have Aaron Rodgers, 2005 to present. Uh, I do consider him to be one of the top three quarterbacks in the NFL now. Uh as far as intelligence and arm uh, uh, skills. At nine, John Elway, to me, that's way too low. John Elway's career, he carried the Broncos for many, many years, carried them to Super Bowls with poor teams, with incomplete teams. When he retired, he led the, the, the history of the NFL as the most winningest quarterback of all time. So way too low there at nine for John Elway for me as a football player. 
Uh, Roger Staubach at eight. I think that's way too high for Roger Staubach at eight in the top 25. Uh, I would not have him in the top 10. Uh, you could argue top 20, uh, but I think that's way too high. I think that's part of being on Dallas's team. I think that's part of the mystique of being in the Navy. Um, and just exposure, being on TV more, more people getting to see him play at that time that he played uh, from 69 to 79. Because his numbers aren't great. He wasn't ever the best quarterback in the league. He wasn't the MVP every year. But he played for the Dallas Cowboys and he was pretty good. And he got to be on TV all the time and do a bunch of interviews and be on TV shows and all that kind of stuff. So he's he's one of the most famous quarterbacks of all time. Dan Marino at seven. I think that's a little low for Dan Marino as well. But there's some guys on this list you could debate as we go here through the rest of the top ten. As we know, Dan Marino, he's one of the guys, the exception, never won the Super Bowl, but considered one of the greatest of all time. And he was. He had a unique delivery. He was uh, putting up 5,000 yards before just about anybody, passing the ball all over the field, carrying the team on his arm, on his toughness um, for many years, 83 to 99 for Dan Marino there with the Dolphins. At six, you have Drew Brees, San Diego Chargers, and New Orleans Saints. Drew Brees is going to be at one point, as long as he plays one more season or the same number of seasons as Tom Brady, he's going to retire with a lot of the passing marks that couldn't be broken for years to come. There's a couple more he's up to break this year. Tom Brady's right there behind him on breaking some of those records as well. He's already got passing yardage mark. He's up for touchdowns. He's getting close to wins. All kinds of things like that. So Drew Brees, definitely one of the better quarterbacks of all time. One of the most underrated quarterbacks of all time. And Miami Dolphins have to be kicking themselves for not bringing that guy in and letting him go to the Saints. Now here's two guys I think on this list. They were good quarterbacks. They were good at their time. They were good in their era. But too high for this list because they don't outweigh a lot of the other guys on this list as far as overall ability as a quarterback. And that's Otto Graham at five, who, yes, the Cleveland Browns and Otto Graham, they dominated their era from the 40s through the 50s, went to something like 10 NFL championship games in that span. But he wasn't one of the best passers. He wasn't the most athletic guy either. Johnny Unitas, not the most athletic guy. Yes, great in his era, but too high, both of them, to be in the top five on this list. Because once you start... Okay, you've gotten past championships. You've gotten past uh, uh, Hall of Fame potential. You've gotten past uh, arm strength. Okay, well, then you get to mobility. Johnny Unitas was not one of the most mobile guys. He was a pocket passer. He'd run if he had to, but he was not fast by any means. He was not elusive by any means. Same with Otto Graham. He'd rather run through you than around you. And I only know that from watching some old clips. So too high for those greats, those NFL legends in their own right for me on this list that Elliot Harrison has put together. Now the top three. You've got Peyton Manning at three, Joe Montana at two, and Tom Brady at one. Hard to argue that. I think Joe Montana is a little high on the list. I think he was part of a system that really was coming around new, that he his skill set, Bill Walsh, George Seifert, they were able to take advantage of and get those Super Bowl wins. And it worked out well. They were on good teams. John Montana was an accurate quarterback. He was a smart quarterback. He was a gutsy quarterback for his size. But I would put Peyton Manning and what he did, his brain, his smart, his intelligence, his football intelligence, IQ, that would put him over what Joe Montana was able to accomplish. Even though Joe has the four Super Bowls and the four Super Bowl tries and has the John Candy moment and Jerry Rice and John Taylor and Roger Craig and great. It was great. It was greatness. You can't take that away. But Peyton Manning's football IQ puts him above Joe Montana in my book. And then Tom Brady, at this point, you have to put him at the greatest quarterback of all time because of all of the stuff he's been able to accomplish in his career, living in the Super Bowl, living in the playoff, all of the division titles, his accomplishments, 
have just gotten to the point that the fact he's not that mobile, that he doesn't have the strongest arm, that he's not the smartest, but he's up there in all of those categories, that it doesn't matter anymore. At some point, the accomplishments just become too much. He's been to nine Super Bowls. He's won six. He's won the division every year but one of his career. He's won it like 10 or 11 years in a row. Now, yes, that's Belichick, but Brady's a big part of that. So I leave, I agree, Tom Brady right now, undoubtedly at this point, greatest quarterback to ever play in the NFL. So that's Elliot Harrison's list. Here's how I reorder it. I have three quarterbacks in the same position that Elliot Harrison has on his list. And that's Ben Roethlisberger at 19, Terry Bradshaw at 17, and Tom Brady at 1. Outside of those three, my order of the exact same quarterbacks is much different. Now, I told you, Roger Staubach, to me, was way too high on that list. I told you I wasn't going to change any of the quarterbacks' names on that list. I was going to use the same ones. So on my list, Roger Staubach comes in at number 25 on this list for his influence on the era for the championships that he won, for the stats he put up compared to all of these other guys, to me, he's 25. 24, Norm Van Brocklin. 23, Lynn Dawson. So I move Lynn Dawson up one. I move Norm Van Brocklin up one. I have Troy Aikman at 22 on my list. Now some people might be like, oh, you just hating on the Cowboys. You moving all the Cowboys quarterbacks down. Well, if Tony Romo was on this list, I'd have Tony Romo above both of those guys as quarterbacks. Was he as accomplished? Did he win as much as they did? Did he have the Super Bowl title they have? No. But is he a better quarterback? Is he a better player at that position? Yes. I have Sid Luckman at 21. I have Russell Wilson because his career is short. He's got a lot more growing to do. He can't be that high on the list yet. I've got him at 20. I've dropped him a couple spots from where Elliot Harrison has. I do have Ben Roethlisberger still in the top 20. We talked about him the other day, the amount of sacks he's given up in prison his career and the stats he's still been able to pick up being sacked that many times and how that physical toughness is such a skill set that you just can't, you, you can't teach it. Super Bowl wins, division titles, Hall of Fame status, 19. Jim Kelly is at 18 on my list. Terry Bradshaw at 17. I've got Bart Starr lower on my list. I have him at 16 because, face it, like I said, he was the general. He didn't have the strongest arm. He didn't have the most accurate. He wasn't the fastest guy. He just did what needed to be done. I've got Sling and Sammy Baugh at 15. Fran Tarkenton at 14. I've got Kurt Warner at 13. Move him up on my list. I think what Kurt Warner was able to do where he came from the comeback he made with Arizona after what happened with him in New York with the Giants. I mean, he paved the way for Eli Manning, right? Had had he been successful in New York, Eli might have sat a little longer, but they brought him in as that bridge guy. It was a horrible time there for Kurt Warner with the Giants. They were not successful. Eli Manning comes in, Kurt Warner moves on to the Cardinals. He's able to then get the Cardinals after a 40 or 50-something year drought into a title game. Almost beats the Pittsburgh Steelers to get that title. Have him as 13 on my list. Aaron Rodgers, I dropped a couple spots again. He's got more to grow. I need more from Aaron Rodgers. Yes, the skill set is there. Yes, the bravado is there. I need more. I need more wins. I need more playoff success. Otherwise, you can't put him above some of these other guys on the list. I have Otto Graham dropped to 11 and Johnny Unitas dropped to 10 on my list. So still prominent positions on the list. Still arguably in or near the top 10. Because of their accomplishments, because of their dominance in their era. What they meant to the game. I move Steve Young up to 9th on my list. Brett Favre up to 8th. Drew Brees drops down one spot to 7 on my list. Because when I get above the 7... These guys, to me, are some of the best quarterbacks to have ever played the game. They have some skill sets. They have the arm strength. They have the mental acumen. They have the calmness. 
in in the face of chaos, they have the leadership that if you had them on their your team, you knew you had a chance. You knew it wasn't over if one of my top six guys was your quarterback, or at least that's how you felt about these guys. I have War Moon at six. To me, Warren Moon is highly underrated in the history of football. He's at least in the top 10. I have him at six on my list. I have Dan Marino at five. Joe Montana drops to four on my list. I moved John Elway up to three on my list from nine to three compared to Elliot Harrison. Why is that? Look at some of those Broncos teams he played on in the 80s. Look at the number of winning seasons. Look at all of the wins he was able to tally up, sometimes with no offensive line, sometimes with no running game, sometimes with receivers being down, with a a lack of defense in some years. Didn't have back-to-back losing seasons in his career. (laughs) Went to five Super Bowls. Probably should have been six. Probably shouldn't have been in a couple of them. Then I have Peyton Manning and Tom Brady rounding out my top 25 quarterbacks using the quarterbacks from Elliot Harrison's list on NFL.com. So that's how I differ. That's where I see some differences there. Um, I understand where Elliot Harrison and um, Jack Andrade uh, came up with their system. If you read the article, they go into a little more depth um, as to how they made their, their picks and their selections and how they went about it. So I definitely recommend reading the article. It, it, but again, here's another list that we're debating because that's what it is. It's list time. It's list season. So that list's out of the way. Let's get to the next list. Series of top five and bottom five position groups ranked by me in the NFL. We've made it through the D-line, the linebacker group, and the secondary group. Today we are on my top five and bottom five offensive line groups. Uh, I will remind you how I came up with my rankings, and then we'll get into the rankings a little bit. So I take each division. You've got four teams in each division. I I lay those out on my spreadsheet. I drop in this week. I dropped in centers, guards, tackles, and any key depth players that those teams might have at those positions. Within your division, at each category, you get a ranking one through four. Okay, so in this case, centers, guards, tackles, and key depth, we have four categories, so you get four scores. I average those together. The team with the best score wins the division, goes on to the one group. Second goes to the two group. Third goes to the three group. Four to the four group for each division. So I end up with four groups, right? I've got them ranked out by who won, who came in second, third, and fourth in your division. I then take those scores that you got. And within your group, the first, second, third, and fourth place group, I rank you out one through eight. I then drop that one through eight into the one through 32 final rankings. Uh, With that being said, my final rankings for the O-line are as follows. I think last week I started with the top of the list, so this week I will start with the bottom of the list. Worst offensive line unit, in my opinion, as we sit today on July 7th, 2019 in the NFL, the one that I'm most worried about is the Minnesota Vikings. Washington Redskins, Miami Dolphins, they've been near the bottom of the list in just about every category so far. Carolina Panthers and the Houston Texans. Now that might might be making some people mad. It really might. But these teams, those teams came last in their division. And again, this is futile. It's just a list. It's just a ranking. It doesn't mean this is how it plays out. In fact, some of the rankings we actually have at the end of the season after it played out don't even make much sense as to who the top or the middle or the bottom units or players at any position are. But it gives us something to debate. It gives us something to talk about. It is interesting to go through and do the work and look at the names of each team and who they have and Compare them to other teams in the division, and who do you think is who you know better? Um, and those teams, to me, they're lacking compared to some of the other teams, especially the teams in their division. At twenty-seven, I have the LA Rams. Twenty-six, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs really don't have that great of an offensive line. They have weapons. 
They have a guy who can make something happen at the quarterback position. They have speed. But not really one of the better offensive lines in the league. Cleveland went from one of the better offensive lines in the league. Now I've got them at 25 going into this season. I've got Jacksonville at 24, Green Bay at 23, Tampa Bay at 22, the Jets at 21, and the Giants at 20. Some of those teams you're really not going to argue with. The Giants, they're building an offensive line. Uh, I'm honestly surprised even on my list that the Giants are where they are because I kind of like some of the players the Giants have. Um, You look at their offensive line. I like Will Hernandez and Kevin Zeitler at the guards. They have, to me, the best guards in the NFC East. That combination is going to be great. Compared to Isaac Samalo, Brandon Brooks for Philadelphia, okay, they're pretty good. Eric Flowers and Brandon Sharif for Washington, Connor Williams and Zach Martin in Dallas. I'll take Will Hernandez and Kevin Zeitler. Uh, The Giants have pretty good tackles. I mean, Mike Reimers, he's had some good seasons. He's had some really bad seasons. Nate Solder's had some good, a a couple good seasons, and last season was a bad season. They don't have the better tackles. Um, You know, they don't have Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins. They don't have Jason Peters and Lane Johnson. But they are better than Trent Williams and Morgan Moses. So once they once they got broken down in their division, I couldn't put them higher than 20. Not with the way the system I put together ranked them out. And that's why we sit back and we argue all of these different rankings and lists that we see because, oh, well, that system didn't take into account if I were going to do this, that, or the other thing. If I were going to do it, it would come out like this. Well, here's how I did it. Here's how it's coming out. So now we're into the top 20. Oakland Raiders... Still a fairly good offensive line at 19. Cincinnati I have at 18. Um, pretty much because of where they came out in their division. I mean, if you look at Cincinnati's offensive line, you've got Billy Price, good center out of Ohio State, uh, Clint Bowling, John Miller at guard, Cordy Glenn and Bobby Hart at tackle, John Jerry and Jonah Williams, the rookie, uh, and, and some depth positions. They came out tied for second in the AFC North with Baltimore for the offensive line. Now I've got them at 19. I haven't said Baltimore yet, so obviously I think Baltimore has a little bit better offensive line than Cincinnati. I have San Francisco at 17. I think they're young. They're getting better. They're getting guys that fit what they want to do. I have Baltimore at 16. So now we're through. The, the teams that came in in third, fourth place, and we're getting into those second place teams now that we're at Baltimore. These are the teams, now this group, the, the nine through 16, that came in second in their division on my rankings. I've got Tennessee at 15, Denver surprisingly at 14, uh, that one really actually did surprise me quite a bit because Denver's offensive line has been garbage for so long. Uh, Connor McGovern, I've got him as the third best center in the division. I've got them with the best guards in the division. I don't really like the guards in this division. Uh, o- Oakland, Chaz, Gre- Chaz Green and Gabe Jackson. Uh, Gabe's getting old. Then the Chargers, Dan Feeney and Michael Schofield. Michael Schofield, okay, he's a better guard than he is a tackle. Dan Feeney, eh, okay, average get-the-job kind of done guy. Andrew Wiley and Laurent Dunavy Tardif for the Kansas City Chiefs. And then you've got Ronald Leary, Leary and Elijah Wilkinson. I'll take that combination, especially when you mix in a Dalton Reisner, their rookie. Um, Garrett Bowles, not the greatest, but Mike Munchak should get him from 11, 12 holding penalties, maybe down to three or four five tops, which is going to be huge for them, and bringing in Jawan James on the right side, who could potentially take over on the left side if it's just the job's not getting done. So Denver comes in at 14, surprising me a little bit there. Buffalo at 13, Seattle at 12, Atlanta at 11. So now we're at my top 10 teams. Philadelphia and Chicago wrap out, uh, wrap up the, the, the second place teams at 10 and 9 respectively. So here's the top eight teams, almost to the top five. Arizona at eight. I've got Detroit at seven. And the Chargers 
I think I said Chargers earlier, but I, I meant the Rams. The Chargers at six. Um, my top five offensive lines in the NFL, Pittsburgh at five, New England at four, New Orleans at three. These top three teams' offensive lines, you look at them on paper, they're just great. You got New Orleans at three, Dallas at two, and Indianapolis at one. Indianapolis, best offensive line in football, in my opinion. And you look at who they have across the board. Ryan Kelly, he's a stud. At guard, you've got Quentin Nelson and Mark Le- Lewinsky. Okay, we all know Quentin Nelson. He was a, a beast. Then you go out to tackle. You've got Anthony Costanzo and Braden Smith. Uh, at, you've got Jamarcus Webb and Nico Saragusa sitting there on your bench. So you've got depth. You've got athleticism. You've got toughness. You've got Earl Gray players on your team. You've got guys who will run block, pass block. They're going to hold it down for Andrew Luck. They're going to hold it down for that running game. Indianapolis gets the best offensive line group in the NFL in my bottom five, top five rankings. That's how I see it. We're under 10 minutes left in the show, so we're going to see if we can get to all of this basketball news that has come out. Kawhi Leonard has finally landed. It was a sneak attack. Uh, When I saw the report that the the Raptors plane and landed in San Diego, I instantly thought, what if he's meeting with the Clippers and there's something else going on? Goes to show you can never count anybody out. That slim chance that we thought we all thought the Clippers had, because I've been saying for months that I thought he was going to the Lakers, that the Clippers had barely a shot. And if he won the championship, the Raptors would get back in the game. The Raptors were kind of in the game. The Lakers looked like they were going to close it out and win it. Then Steve Ballmer and the Clippers came through and said, you know what? Wait, 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 wait. My man Kawhi has been talking to Paul George. Paul George, after signing his max contract, saying he loved being in OKC. He wanted to be in OKC. He was going to stay in OKC. He was going to build something in OKC. Comes out, you can't trust Paul George and what he's saying ever. Because it's a business. He turned around and said, I've been talking to my boy Kawhi in separate places on the days. He's also meeting with the Lakers because he's trying to work his best thing in the background. Paul George asked for a trade. And the Clippers unload everything they can, first round picks and players. Four first round picks guaranteed. A couple swaps, you know, swapping first round picks. So the Clippers have put themselves in a position. Yes, they've got players. Yes, they got Patrick Beverly back. Yes, they've got Lou Williams. Now they've got Kawhi. They've got Paul George. They are a contender. They're one of the better teams in the West. They've made it interesting. It's more competitive. Not all the best players on one team. But now they're not building a team. It is up to this group to go out and win multiple titles. Because you've got no picks coming in. You don't have contracts that players or teams are going to give up picks for, unless it's Kawhi, unless it's Paul George, which is not what the Clippers are focusing on. That's their core now. So you've given up all these picks over the next five, six years. That means the next five, six years, this core and whatever you can establish in free agency around them with veterans and young players and cheap contracts is all you've got. Same thing would have happened to the Lakers had they been able to bring in Kawhi and had the three max contracts. You're you're pulling pieces together after that. Now, the Lakers didn't give up draft picks. The Clippers unloaded a historical amount of draft picks to get Paul George, which is what brought them Kawhi, which is the only thing they could do to not completely lose the city of L.A. to the Lakers again. They fought. They scrapped. They got back into it. They had a better year last year than the Lakers. They have better years recently than the Lakers. And they were watching the Lakers in one offseason pass them by. They've now made it competitive. Both of those L.A. teams will be fun to watch. Now, the Lakers had to scramble. They get Rondo. They get DeMarcus Cousins, JaVale McGeary, Danny Green. They have Anthony Davis. I still expect them to, you know, mix and match some pieces. We could see a Kyle Korver. Don't count out Andre Iguodala just yet. Um, Russell Wilsbrook might be traded. Don't count out a Chris Paul, Carbello Anthony, guys like this. Uh, maybe even Dwight Howard for some reason I've heard talked about as potentially landing in L.A. at some point. A John Wall, a Bradley Beal. There could be picks traded, players traded. 
don't count out any more movement from that Lakers team just yet. They have the money to spend. Um, the Raptors, they couldn't get the deal done. They were offered Restbook and Paul George, it seemed like, and they could not get that done. So now you're going to go NBA champion to maybe an eighth seed if you're lucky next year with the Raptors as they just don't, they wouldn't get rid of uh, Pascal Sockham. Um in a package, didn't want to do that. I'm not sure why you bring Westbrook and Paul George in. You could have picked right up basically where you left off losing Kawhi. But Paul George goes with Kawhi. OKC, okay, nobody apparently wants to be in OKC or nobody wants to play with Westbrook because now everybody who's played there, Kevin Durant, James Harden, they're gone. Westbrook's the last one standing. It seems like maybe they're going to get rid of him, too, and completely rebuild in OKC with a bunch of young talent, let Billy Donovan do a little bit more of what he does well with young talent. Uh, But they've blown it up. I I expect Westbrook to be traded. Houston Rockets seem like a contender there. Bring him back in with James Harden. I can see those two guys working off of each other because they're very similar in the way they play have each one of them play a side of the floor and just dominate and score, go to the basket, dish, put up threes. Could be an exciting form of basketball if that were to come out. Going to be hard for Houston to make that happen. Clippers, like we said, they lose all the picks. They're in a win-now mode. They have to build with vets and rely on Paul George and Kawhi. Then you look at the Celtics. They're winners. They're trying to be in there. They've got an interesting young lineup, a little bit better, a mix of guys. Brooklyn, what will they be in two years? Golden State, where are they going to be? I think they're still a top five, six team in the West, but the West has gotten better. Denver, they didn't really add anything, but another year of uh, of um, development, bringing their young team along. Does Michael Porter add anything into the group? Uh, how long before Ball Ball is entered into the group? Utah's gotten better. Houston's still out there. So a lot of good teams, a lot of good basketball. I'm excited. I'm happy that the Kawhi watch is over. We can start looking at some of these other free agents that are going to start filling out rosters, maybe looking for surprise trades. We're going to start talking about baseball a little more. Next week, we'll do our top five receiving groups. In the receiving groups, I'm going to include the tight end group because, face it, there's not a lot of inline just blocking tight ends anymore. They only run a few routes. A lot of tight ends are used heavily in the passing game. So look forward to my top five and bottom five um, receiving groups next week. We'll also talk baseball going into the All-Star break next week and any other sports stories that come through. That's everything I got for today. I appreciate y'all. Love y'all. That's real talk. Until next time, be real.